Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. The trailer, Andy, for this movie, it makes me feel just like the movie makes me feel. Dirty. <laughs> Well, we talked about this trailer. I think this was uh, one of us picked yeah. it as a as one of our trailers uh, a while back. Um, it's it's an interesting uh, trailer. It, it sets up the story and it sets up, you know, this is a, a true story. It's time we knew the truth uh, of, of a situation that happened during uh, Detroit's 1967 uh, 12th Street riot, um, specifically focusing on the Algiers Hotel, which, although the trailer doesn't necessarily let you know that it's focusing so much on that particular incident. Um, it's, it's, it, it sets it up interestingly, you know, I think you get a good idea of what the story is going to be about and that it's going to be divisive. It's race issues, uh, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And it, it certainly highlights the Catherine Bigelow element, you know, from the director, from the Academy award winning director of the Hurt mm -hmm. Locker and zero dark 30. Mm -hmm. So it does all the stuff it needs to to sell it, I think. Yeah, I think it does, too. And, you know, these movies, I think, are, are low-hanging fruit um, for for us, and in, in, in particularly regarding trailers. Like, when we see movies that are that that look like this, they're, they're divisive, right? They're movies that invariably 
there is going to be uh, a a position that this movie will not be able to accurately portray uh, the experience on the streets of Detroit. And it is a shameless grab for money. And it's, you know, all of those things, all of the tropes that 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 we hear. And, uh, you know, I, I look forward to hearing about the, the performance of this movie. I know it wasn't that great. And yet I feel like, you know, the other position is, wow, I'm so glad that I'm going to learn something about this. This is not something I knew anything about. And uh, just because of its time in history and, you know, when I was born uh, and uh, it, it it probably is time not to latch too heavily on the, uh, you know, on the tagline for the trailer. It probably is time to be, you know, to be exposed to this, you know, however you interpret the story. There's a generation that needs to hear the story and this becomes a conduit for it. So I, I feel like that actually comes across in the trailer and. Uh, and and I appreciate it. I also appreciate the the glimpses of all the people that we see in the trailer. They I think they do a good job of of giving us snapshots of all of the main um, the main storylines that will eventually come together. And I like the way they don't give away how they're going to come together. Uh, to to your point, so uh, I actually think the trailer was was effective. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't make me want to visit Detroit anymore than I did. This, <laughs> this is not a sales At least piece. Sixties. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it, it's it's an odd one because it, um, uh, it may, maybe that's the wrong word, but it's it is one of those films that you see, and when you watch it, it it's like okay, there's a lot of talk going on these days about police brutality and the way the police handle uh, the African American community and handle situations when. You know, it's a, it's one black uh, person against a cop and and all of the things that have happened because of that. And it does like watching the trailer. It's like, OK, so it feels like they're trying to tell a story to kind of get that perspective, you know, tell a story of that, those types of situations. Um, and, you know, it's it's tricky because it's it's telling a historical incident, but it's also trying to find a way to perhaps comment on what's going on, um, you know, in present day and the fact that, you know, 50 years later, not much has changed. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. And, and it, it does make me, as I watch the trailer, it's, it's one of those things where it does make me go, okay, I wonder how effective that's going to be. You know, are they going to, are they doing a good job of, of the parallels here? Or is it going to, is it going to end up suffering in some way because of it? And I think that's, um, I think that's always an, an interesting element when you watch trailers like this of a historical piece that also is is uh, relevant to modern times. How are they going to balance mm -hmm. that? And um, that was something that I thought when I watched this trailer. But did they do it okay? I guess you'll find out, won't you? Here in Detroit, a city of war. On the city's west side, a 150 block area is off limits to everybody. U.S. Army paratroopers, National Guardsmen, state and local police are continuing the fight against a handful of snipers. Hello. Oh, everything is fine. No trouble here. I'll sleep when they stop riding. Hey, fellas. I'm going to that grocery store across the street. I come bearing gifts. Thank you. You got any sugar? Nah, don't push it, man. It's a war zone out there. They're destroying the city. <laughs> Oh, hey, y'all seeing this? Hey, look, we're not too far from the Algiers. Let's just go there until all this blows over. <laughs> when you're black, it's almost like having a gun pointed at your face. It's like this. Hey, boy, what you doing on my street? Get that gun off me. Or what? <laughs> you shoot it. Oh, man. <laughs> it's just a start. Just, it, it just starts racing. <laughs> This is The Next Reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hey, hey, hey. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, we are preparing a very unfavorable Yelp review on our stay at the Algiers Hotel with Catherine Bigelow's 2017 drama, Detroit. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app, or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you enjoy tuning in and are interested in supporting our ongoing work investigating great film, please consider a regular donation through our Patreon page. You'll get to join our back channel conversations on Discord, 
Help us pick movies for upcoming series and listen to the members-only weekend show, The Saturday Matinee, where we talk movies, trailers, and more. Plus, we have a battle of the lists of movies related to our show that week. On this week's list, uh, in celebration of Detroit, the movie we're uh, going to talk about right now, we are going to be doing lists of favorite movies featuring disappointing moments in American history. <laughs> the That's bar great. is pretty low. So just head on over to <laughs> patreon.com slash the next reel. This is one of the ex- of, of these films, Andy. It's an example of one of these films that I don't. I don't know if I'm going to be able to talk about it right. That that there feels like to me there's going to be a right and a wrong way to approach this movie. And I, I'm going to be really honest with you. I'm worried. I'm worried that I'm going to do it wrong. Well, you're probably going to do it wrong. Uh, right out of the gate, though, I'm going to tell you, Pete, <laughs> I'm, I was so disappointed watching this movie because I walked into it fully expecting it to be a sequel to Dr. Detroit. Either that. Or if not, at least a sequel to Guys and Dolls, featuring the continuing exploits of Nathan <laughs> Detroit. I can't tell you how disappointed I am that I got neither of those things. Rightfully so. You should you should also write a strongly worded letter, <laughs> an opinion piece for the Times. I am going to. I'm going. To. I, I I think based on <laughs> based on your first impression, I no longer if I worry if I'm going to be doing it right and wrong because I know you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Inevitably, that's always the case. <laughs> this is from the perspective of this movie as a sequel to Guys and Dolls. It is terrible. <laughs> Where was Rusty Charlie? Okay, but as far as the movie goes, it's there's there's several elements that I think you know we can certainly discuss. One is obviously just uh, Catherine Bigelow and Mark Bull and their um, work to kind of tell this story and how they chose to tell the story. Um, obviously, there's the the reality of what happened uh, in uh, Detroit in 1967. Um, kind of inconveniently uh, on my birthday, but uh, oh uh, yeah, I know. What are you gonna do? Not your actual birthday. <laughs> not my actual birthday. No, I was not even no. a thought at that point. But yes, it. Uh, but I guess this whole thing happened on the on your birthday. Years. Yeah, I found it frustrating personally. I thought it was an interesting moment in American history to learn about. I had no idea that this happened. I had no idea that tanks were driving down the streets of uh, an American city as the National Guard was patrolling. I mean, it was pretty shocking to kind of learn all of that. Um, I I like stories like this where you get uh, a wide swath of viewpoints. You get a lot of different characters and uh, and you see how a lot of different things uh, unfold through different perspectives. What I found really disappointing in the end for me was that everything really kind of came down to just the Algiers Hotel incident. I felt like there were probably so many other stories that we could have been following in a film called Detroit, not Algiers Hotel. I felt like, you know, I wanted more stories. I wanted to get more perspectives of things that were happening during these riots and just really get all of that. I don't mind that they narrowed it down to one particular incident, um, although I just felt like the title is a little misleading. I just, I just didn't feel like it represented the story that I wanted to hear as well as it should have. And I felt like they chose to really hone in on this particular story because of what was happening today with all of the issues going on between police and the African-American community. I felt like they really chose to, to pinpoint this one thing with these bad cops, bad white cops, um, uh, taking on this uh, group of African-Americans and two white women in this hotel situation that happened. And in the end, I felt like it uh, missed its mark. I didn't feel like it told the story the way that it should have to represent it uh, in the most effective way. Man, see, there you go. I am puzzled. I struggle with this because I, in fact, quite enjoyed this movie in in so far as a movie like this can be enjoyed. Uh, I think that the principal characters portrayed, um, you know, interesting range and interesting narratives. I think Mark Bowles' script uh, is is simply the script of a guy who went to Detroit and interviewed the people who experienced it and fictionalized where he had to, but found himself compelled to write uh, the story of what happened at this hotel. And I think he did it in a way that did what 
you know, what his stories actually do best. They, they say, here's a social context. Here's what's going on in the world. And then here is we're going to use real footage and we're going to show you what's going on in the city in Detroit. And then we're going to zoom in even further and show you what's going on, uh, you know, at the hotel and even further at the narrative lines of each of these major four sort of characters. And we're going to show you how they all intertwine. So that that's zooming in from the the very wide social context into the geographic, into the local and the personal. I think it works very well for me. Uh, I think that uh, the the you know I adored every one of the major characters uh, and actors portraying them. I think there there wasn't a a single you know uh, piece in here that was uh, that that didn't work for me as a film. Uh, and and so I I don't know I'm I'm having a hard time rationalizing uh, and and I I'm trying to find it find ways for me not to like the film I really am like I'm trying to understand why it misses misses the mark because I connected with so many of the individual elements so strongly yeah and I was really struggling with that too because I I typically really enjoy films like this and I. I I, you know, it's, I always find it interesting when I see something like this or like Ghosts of Mississippi, where it's a, it's based on a real situation and it just, it completely doesn't work for me. But I, you know, for me, it's just like, you know, starting the film off, um, I, you know, 20 minutes in and I, it already felt like it was just a muddled mess. Like there, I like that there's all these different people, but it's, it just was disruptive. Like I, Normally, like in a Robert Altman film or something like that, where you're getting all these different stories and you're seeing how things come together, it, I find it really interesting. And I like kind of piecing it together and go, OK, I see how things are going to fit together in this one. It just felt like really a disruptive way to tell this story. And I could not get into it. And 20 minutes in, I was just like, man, I just feel like this is a real mess. Like I cannot for the life of me, figure out what they're trying to do here. And it was very frustrating. And maybe it was that I didn't get to know enough of the characters uh, well. You know, I, I there were a few that we met, but like the um, the uh, the National Guardsman, who uh, I guess you could kind of say that um, uh, John Boyega's character dismukes befriends, you know, when he brings out the coffee and stuff. Um, like he was a character that I felt like I would have liked to spend a little more time with him than we really do. I mean, he seemed like an interesting character and that was kind of the situation for me. Even Anthony Mackie's character as, as, uh, as green, this guy in the hotel, I was like, I wish that I had known a little bit more about what was going on with him and brought him to this whole thing. And I, I don't know, it's, it's just a frustrating thing where I felt like it just isn't setting up the story in a way that's, that's, um, that's working for me. And by the time we get into the Algiers and into the hotel room and we have Carl shooting the starter pistol, um, you know, it's like, okay, well now we're here, but I felt like there was a lot of other stuff that should have been happening and it wasn't. And so I don't know, for me, it just really ended up setting up a story that was, um, more, uh, frustrating than not. And also I have to say, it, I was really frustrated and this, I don't know if this is completely fair to say, cause I don't know how much of it's based on fact versus uh, fictionalized, but Will Poulter's character as our bad cop, our main bad cop, uh, Kraus, um, he was um, almost so um, uh, like uh, just over the top bad cop that I really kind of struggled with how, how much he was just the bad guy. You know, it just, it seemed so, so on the nose that, uh, it kind of, uh, made me less interested in, in what was going to happen. Cause I'm like, Oh, well, he's just going to be the bad cop because he's so bad. You know, he shoots a guy right out of the gate. It's, it was just, it was a very frustrating story for me. I I could not disagree with you more about Poulter. I think he portrayed the and and his his character is an amalgamation character, right? It's not like Dismukes, who is directly you know a, a historical figure that was there. Uh, Poulter is is based on a number of characters that were the police officers, according to Bull, and he sort of rolled them all together and created this amalgamation character. So yeah, he didn't exist, and he serves the the film in terms of an intention, you know. But what I th this movie is about ripples in a pond and uh when one little tiny thing um you know in the context of of the story ripples out and impacts all these people in different ways and uh you know and wraps them up in a story uh that that is so far beyond their control and that is 
both from the perspective of the black characters portrayed in this movie and the white characters portrayed in this movie. We may never have known about the deep, deep seated racism of, uh, you know, on the, this particular unit of the Detroit Police Department had they not been put in this situation. Uh, and, and I think that is one of the things that Poulter actually pulls off really well, that in the beginning, we don't know that he's a, a, a racist. In the beginning, we don't know that he's a, you know, he's a terrible thing and the uh, a terrible sort of you know, amalgamation of, of, you know, hatred. Uh, and, and that emerges when he is put into, in a position of stress over the course of the movie. I think he plays that very well uh, and, and goes from being a, a dedicated cop to the service of the streets to a, an absolute diabolical anathema that is the source of just great rage. As a white person watching this movie, I was so enraged by white people. And I feel like that's a, uh, that's a, a a position that that is, I, I don't know if you if you think movies are made with any sort of intention uh, to you know convey a, a sense of emotional resonance. That is the intention that I get from this movie is, uh, and and uh, but I also feel like this is not a movie about Detroit. This is a movie about this little ripple in the Algiers Hotel that caused something to happen. And results in people ultimately not noticing that it happened. And that is the heartbreaking piece of this movie. And when it ends and we ultimately, I mean, you and I both have didn't even know that it happened. Like it, it was a major um, thing to these people's lives. And it ended up being, um, you know, absolutely, you know, ultimately sort of forgotten uh, in, in history. I, I think that is a that's a bit of heartbreak that is is terribly resonant for me uh, in this film. I I really struggle as I was reading reviews of this thing and, and the reviews that that come in, especially from black reviewers who are like, well, the black people weren't treated with, uh, you know, with the dignity. They weren't you know, they were just like pieces moved around on a board. One of them said uh that, that a movie, uh, A.O. Scott's review says it's curious that a movie set against the backdrop of black resistance and rebellion, however inchoate and self-destructive its expression may have been, should become a tale of black helplessness and passivity. The white men, the decent ones, as much as the brutes have the answers, the power of the agency. I, I can't tell you how much I disagree with that review. That I mean, it is a, or, or I should say, I agree with this review, that the point of of this experience and the rage is to say, look, we are set in a period of black resistance and rebellion, and here it failed because of the brute power of racism in this small group of people. And and that caused a deep emotional reaction for me uh, that I, I feel like I connected with really well on screen. This is, to me, I'll tell you, this is, uh, you know, if if not the best thing that Bigelow has done for me, it's it's certainly right up there. That's interesting. I, I, God, and so, I so wish that I could say that. And that's the thing that I find frustrating with it is I just, I, I, I feel closer to the, these critics that just say it's a moral failure and things like that, where I'm just like, I don't feel like uh, maybe it was Bigelow and Bowl weren't the people to tell this story. I don't know. But I just felt like it was not, uh, and I don't, I don't think it's like one of those things where it's like, you know, put Ava DuVernay in, in here and she could have done it right. Like, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, they the the way they chose to to funnel the story down for me uh didn't work and i felt like maybe if it was a different storyteller who could look at it from a different angle i would have found a way to get into the story better but i mean i can certainly appreciate it and the thing like you you're saying i do appreciate that this story is or this film is telling a story that uh of a real incident that happened in this country that i knew nothing about so i certainly appreciate that because um i just found it absolutely shocking that it turned into this situation that um was so horrifying and honestly the thing that for me was the most powerful moment in the entire film was when there was a little girl in the early early in the film a little girl is you know hears the noises in the streets and stuff and she goes to her her window in her apartment and she looks out the window and she sees all these tanks and everything driving down the street and like the national guard and the army and everything um, rolling down the road and one and then we cut to them and one of them uh, like a sniper or, or some no not a sniper but one of them sees her and calls her oh sniper sniper and they open fire on the building and just tear it to pieces and that to me was the most horrifying moment in the film 
seeing something like that happen because you're putting like a major military force into this, you know, small uh, town, uh, this, this city where normal people are living and they're not used to seeing things like this happen. And it turns into this major thing where you have, I, I looked, I, I can't remember where I saw the numbers, uh, but I can't find them right now of how many military people rolling through the streets. And these are people who are used to being in war situations and, and, here they are on the streets of Detroit, and they see something like a little girl in a window and instantly assume that it's a sniper, not that it's, hey, it's a little girl in her room. That, to me, was the uh, most powerful moment of the whole film. It was just shocking to me. That was, to me, a shocking MacGuffin, too. I thought that was going to be, and not knowing anything about the story, I thought that was going to be the entree into the the you know the real story of Detroit, and uh, I was surprised that it was it, they moved through it so quickly. Uh, it was crushing. It was crushing and fast, and like a bolt of lightning. Here, here's here's the situation. I just found is the uh, Tanya Blanding was the little girl. Um, she was a four year old girl. She was huddled in her living room on a second floor apartment. Um, I guess there had been some sniper fire as, as the guard tank was being moved. Uh, one of the occupants uh, apparently lit a cigarette and guardsmen opened fire on the building with rifles and the tank's 50 caliber machine gun, gun and uh, ended up killing that little girl. So uh, pretty horrifying. There were 1,189 people injured. Um, 407 of them were civilians. 289 were suspects. 214 were Detroit police officers. 134 Detroit firefighters. 55 Michigan National Guardsmen. 67 Michigan State police officers. 15 Wayne County Sheriff's deputies and eight federal soldiers. So there was a lot of fighting, ha- yeah, and a lot of people lot, were getting hurt. A lot, and and I think it's I think this, you know, uh, to me, focusing on the Algiers is a way to 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 isolate one incident as representative of the whole and and I feel like that's important I think anything bigger than that and and the the complaint comes from the other side she tried to do too much she tried to tell a story that was too big she tried to take on too much and become uh, too much of an activist in this in this uh, film I'm finding myself equally frustrated by Richard Brody's review right now Bigelow's intentions come through clearly to depict an incident and a climate of racism to show that the cruelty of these deeds was multiplied by their ultimate impunity and to suggest that in the intervening half century the events depicted of the events depicted since the film took place little has changed oh my goodness yes that's it he calls that a moral failure i call that the intent of the film like that's the point the the point is not to be graceful to the black people that are portrayed in this film the intent is to be hard on the white people that are portrayed in this film who actually pushed the black people around as moral failures themselves right that is the that's the that's the point. I don't know how you can approach this film and and honor black people uh, portrayed in it more than treating them the way Bigelow treated them in this movie as as the subjects of people who have vileness and hate in their hearts. And and that's the story to me. That's what makes me so mad and and why it connects so well. Ah, yeah. Boisterous I, yawp. <laughs> it's it's frustrating i don't know i i really wish that i i could figure out the way that this story should have been told because it just wasn't told that way and maybe it's because it just it seemed like it it never settled on the specific thing like if the whole thing was just the incident at the algiers motel or hotel would that would i have liked that better i don't know maybe by the time like we if got they'd to the ended trial, at the end of the trial no, or before, the, the, trial. before I, the trial yeah, yeah when they're when they get out like yeah if the trial like the trial just felt like here we go again. It's the entire situation all over again, but now it's lawyers instead of cops. You know, just it just felt like we we're just plodding on through this thing. And I so will say, I, and, and I'll agree with you on that point. I think the the trial slowed down, and I think as as much as they leaned on historical fo- footage and documentation, I think they could have played that out documentarily and and rolled us through the trial uh, to the grimness of you know the fact that the good guys didn't win, the the people who needed to be vindicated were not vindicated uh, at the hands of of you know exactly who we expect to to resolve it. They could have resolved this in a way that was quick and efficient and still hit us hard where it was important i i agree i will say though john krasinski was fantastic as a sleazy lawyer yeah he was (laughs) loved him so much in there 
And I think they uh, made his suit a little large so that he yep. wouldn't look so big. And <laughs> it was just perfect. It was perfect. He was great. Oh man, he was great. Yeah, it's yeah. I I don't know. I I, I guess we can keep going back and forth, but it's it, in the well, end. Well, mostly because I'm so heartbroken because I thought you were going to love this. I thought you were. This was going to be your kind of thing, and it's it breaks my heart that that we have diverged. <laughs> On this, this point, <laughs> I this to me is as uh, maybe not quite as much a mortal sin of a film um, as what uh, Rob Reiner did with The Ghost of Mississippi, which, man, was I so angry at him when he made that because I just felt like it was just a misstep after misstep. Um, but this story, um, it's up there. You know, I just I don't feel like they found the story to tell um, um, or the, the right path to tell the story. And I ended up being very frustrated with it. So yeah, it was frustrating. It was a very frustrating film for me. Uh, I mm. will say though, I really enjoyed the way that it kicked off with that little animated segment to kind of set the story up as far as, you know, uh, the post slavery, why so many African Americans moved North, how they settled in Detroit, how kind of the neighborhood turned into what it did as the white people moved to the suburbs and left kind of the 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 black neighborhood to kind of uh, go downhill. I found that a really interesting way to set this story up and set the place up. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you. Uh, I I think those and and in fact, I I found myself thinking, gosh, I I love all these little animated vignettes that we're seeing in movies right now. Like that seems to be a thing that uh, is is everywhere, and I I think it it works really well to get us up to speed. Much uh, better nice Black touch. Panther than it was here. Well, yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> but hey, it's a better movie. The sand was awesome. Oh, it was awesome. Uh, so anyway. Yeah. Uh, you know, part of it, I, I think part of it is I, I have an affinity for Mark Bull. And and we talked to Mark Bull. Uh, I, I, we're struggling to remember when. Uh, it was either for Zero Dark Thirty or what was the other one? Now I've Hurt forgotten Locker. the other one. Oh, Hurt Locker, right. Uh, we called him up, got a little interview with him. And so embedded in one of those episodes is our conversation with Mark Bull. I think it was Zero Dark Thirty. And and he's a genuinely nice and and intentional and and thoughtful guy. And I, I really enjoyed that conversation. And so I, I have a high opinion of him and what he was trying to do here. And it's, it's hard not to watch a movie with that, you know, for me, with that sort of coloring of my opinion. I I. I think the intention was was pure in terms of how he wanted to portray these characters and create characters where he had to. So, um, so I'm I'm definitely on Team Bull. Uh, in terms of of you know just the screenplay, I guess I, I'm assuming that you find the writing just as jarring as the overall presentation. I, I mean, the story works. I don't think that the script itself um, was flawed as far as the way the characters moved through it and everything. I mean, I, th I thought that they wrote it well. I just think that the structure and the, the, the construct of the script was, was really where I, I, yeah. I just struggled. Um, uh, but I mean, I think Mark Boll does great work. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, and I think that there is stuff in here that shows that he knows how to handle some interesting situations, some tense scenes. You know, I, I think that between him and Bigelow, they're good. They, I mean, they have enough of a shorthand now between, uh, you know, Zero Dark Thirty and The Hurt Locker, uh, where I feel like they've kind of tapped into these these true stories and how these situations unfold, and they're able to really uh, tell uh, fascinating stories about interesting real people in real events. This is just one where I just don't think they quite nailed it, but um, I, I can't fault them for trying. And yes, I mean, as you said, the intentions are there. They're obviously not going into this with the intention of making a messy film. Um, I just I think that it just ended up being messy and, uh, you know, good intentions, though. Let's do the deep scene dive, Andy. Let's do it. The deep scene dive that we are doing today. This is the scene before the inciting incident uh, of the film. We're, we're in the hotel room. We're right about, what we say, 45 minutes, 46 minutes in? Yeah, 45. And 45, where the girls and Larry and uh, Fred, yeah, and Fred yeah. show up in the hotel room uh, with uh, the, um, the the rest of the gentlemen who are, and, and they enact uh, a, a brief play in one act. It's a great little scene um, where, where you get, um, I mean, it's an uncomfortable scene. I mean, we're, com we're kind of coming in mid scene um, because there's a lot setting up the scene initially when uh, Julie and Karen bring Larry and Fred up to the room of Carl and, and Aubrey and their buddies. Um, and it's just kind of the tense, you know, tense scene of, uh, of too many guys with too few girls. <laughs> the guys all kind of, 
you know, eyeballing each other. And the girls are like, you know, I, I love what uh, Julie says, where she's just like, you know, where I come from, people say hello and how are you? <laughs> nice to meet you. Shake hands. You know, and that was a great little icebreaker, I thought, in this kind of tense scene. But it, and then and then it just kind of uh, it, it builds. But then we come in kind of when the, the news is on and they're seeing news about what's happening. That really kicks into this situation where uh, Karen is just like, why? What is you know, what's what is this, all this happening? Why? Why is all this stuff happening or whatever she says? I can't remember exactly. And that that kicks Carl off into the whole thing. You don't you don't really get it because you're white and all that. And he kind mm-hmm. of portrays this whole police brutality thing you know he pulls out a starter pistol and basically waves it in front of well we we don't know nobody knows it's a starter pistol they just think it's a gun he's waving it in larry's face and then he kind of does this whole thing with his buddy uh i don't think it's aubrey i think it's one of his other buddies as they kind of play acting this whole you know cop taking down a black man scene and then going all the way through carl shooting him and everybody thinks that that uh, he's dying only to find out that it is just a start start pistol and but it's a great way to kind of set up uh get a sense of the viewpoint of these characters and and how these black characters see the police and how the white people these girls just don't get it and i thought it was a really interesting look at um you know the place that everyone's coming to when this situation kicks off yeah, I do, I do too. It, uh, both the place physically, because we get a sense of the the sort of uh, the state of these rooms, you know, these these sort of mini extended stay rooms, we'll say. And, yeah, it's uh, quite and, the apartment and, that they're living uh, in. Right, right. I mean, they have the little kitchen and everything. He's cooking sausages, hot dogs, things like that. And, and the place, you know, socioeconomically and culturally uh, where we start. Um, and, and I think it's a it's a great scene, too, for these girls, right? Um, uh, Hannah Murray and, and Caitlin Deaver, they are uh, as the white girls who get embroiled in this thing because, you know, they're, you know, whatever their intentions are, uh, they are uh, hanging around with these black guys. And that becomes an issue of great contention. And I think to see them sort of... Um, be so natural in sort of owning themselves in the, uh, you know, and, and being who they are at this point in history in the middle of this this room is just part of the gang is is great. I think they were were fantastic in this film. Well, and to a certain extent, um, they kind of become the uh, the surrogate uh, audience or the surrogate characters for the white audience to kind of come right. into this situation um, and go, oh, OK this helps me understand it too you know the perspective that these these african american characters have when they are um um you know looked at by a police officer and just how how demeaning it can be when a police officer um stops you and talks to you that way and and uh it's it's i mean it is shocking and it's shocking to these girls and it's it's scary and it makes for uh, a kind of a tense moment as as Carl is kind of doing this whole thing with his gun. I thought they played it really well. I also thought it was really interesting just seeing the dichotomy between characters like Carl and Larry, who is completely on the opposite spectrum. I mean, here he is a singer of of this, you know, essentially like a Motown group and uh or you know trying to you know not quite made it there uh group. yeah they're waiting and, for their big break their big record deal right and and uh and he uh is you know he's just like oh yeah we're here and we're performing in town or whatever he says uh before the scene kicks in and uh which is great going all the way through carl kind of making fun of him at the end of the scene um I, it, but it's just it's nice seeing kind of such a difference between these different characters. And I have to say, Algie Smith um, playing Larry, I was just uh, like he was a fantastic find for the uh, the guy that we're watching through this film. I, I really, really was just mesmerized by him. He was a great screen presence. I really enjoyed every bit that he was uh, in this film. And um, he's got a great voice, too, all the way through the end when he's singing in the church choir. And it's just like this is I can see why they did choose to, to focus on him because he does end up feeling like and maybe it's just because he sings so well. He does feel like the soul of the story. 
Yeah, I agree. And, you know, he is a great example of what they end up doing with, um, you know, with this this character that we're showing the other side of Detroit. Right. I mean, this is the side of Detroit that doesn't want to get involved in the, you know, the in in the war that is going, the culture war, and in, in fact, then the street war that is going on, uh, you know, over black and white. I mean, he wants to be, at the beginning of the film, a singer. He wants to be a Motown singer. And the transformation that he goes through and the way it manifests in his character that now, uh, after this all happens, that we get to see him, like, quit singing because it's the white people that are subsidizing uh, the the black entertainment business, right? That that Motown is run by white people. When he sees the white producers through the um, through the glass in the isolation booth and walks out, uh, I, that is a that's a horrifying moment in in many ways. Certainly for him, transformative. You know, do you know who pays for this music? Do you know who's listening to this music? Uh, he says, and that that becomes something that he hangs his hat on as a result of his sort of trauma. Uh, around the experience of the Algiers. I thought that was fantastic. And so, you know, he's one example of where you you really do get to know these characters in a different way, not just in the context of the Algiers. You, you get to spend time with them in these little moments that teach you who these people are. And I thought that was very powerful. And see, to that end, because I completely agree with everything that you just said, to that end, I felt like if this had been more of like a biopic about uh, about this particular character and we're just really looking at Larry Cleveland Reed and his journey to kind of become this singer going through his trauma of the whole situation and his redemption as he joins the the church choir and finds that peace within himself again i find that a much more compelling story and i felt like they they crammed so much in here trying to find a way to to shape it into something that was you know hitting in modern times i just felt like it loses it but everything you just said about Larry i so agree with so, hmm. see, I, I didn't need a whole biopic. I feel like he was a part of a puzzle that actually just came together very nicely for me. He is a fantastic find. You're absolutely right. And he's a he's coming up on a, a film of a book that's been on my bedside table for too long. The Hate You Give is in post-production right now. And, and that should be a, a very interesting uh, film. I hope uh, good things for it. I've heard such wonderful things about the novel by Angie Thomas, uh, and he is in it again with Anthony Mackie, uh, is, is in this movie, so along with another fantastic uh, cast, looks like. So that's he's one to watch. Uh, I also think Jacob Lattimore is fantastic as as his buddy, um, uh, Fred, Fred, uh, yeah. as Fred Temple, as, as Larry's buddy, uh, and sort of the, I guess, manager of the band. I wasn't sure if he, I felt like he was just like a buddy. Like, I don't know. It was weird. I, I could never quite figure out what the relationship was. Was he just a good friend? Was he the manager or was he I just kind of, it's, it's like when you first start a band and you have a manager and the manager is the one who brings water bottles to the rehearsals. Like, it, <laughs> like it's so like, dumb. you don't really know what a manager is yet, but you're calling him a manager, even though he's not really managing anything. He's <laughs> like sweeping up after you leave that kind of a thing. That's who this guy is. He's, he is young. And I thought he was fantastic, particularly in the lineup in the hallway, uh, the way he stood up at the end. Uh, you know, I, I think he was just he, he was great. He was the he was the moral anchor and, it, and, and fully a, a, a tragic character as yeah. as he does become the one who uh, refuses right there in Krauss's face saying, I see I see a dead black guy that yeah. you guys killed. Let's try that again. Uh, I don't see anything. What do you see? I see a dead guy right there. I see a dead guy right there. Like that was that was it was great. It was great. It was it was a really interesting choice. And I'm guessing a lot of that was, um, you know, fictionalized based on, uh, you know, what people uh, think happened uh, since obviously Fred didn't make it yeah. out. It, it, but it made for an interesting character moment for sure. And in this scene, there's I mean, there's really not much of of fred i mean largely he and he's just watching i mean we get a lot more of larry because carl is waving the gun in uh his face and julie's face you know that's right, that's right. kind of the the main uh crux of this particular scene but we certainly but fred certainly always is this character who's kind of that compass a little bit for larry larry's always looking to fred or trying to convince fred to like join in or whatever and so it, yeah. it does make for an interesting pair well, that's a great way to put it, too, because it, it, it is only after Fred is gone that Larry 
comes off the rails and has to find a new direction. And and so, you know, compass is a is a great way to put it. Yeah. Uh, and we've got so we've talked about the ladies and uh, then we have Jason Mitchell. Oh, my goodness. Jason Mitchell. I could have used a lot more Carl. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Jason Mitchell. He was easy. E uh, in, um, um, you know, I'm talking about straight out of Compton. Uh, it just he's fantastic. He um, really exemplifies kind of that position that uh, or the viewpoint that that these African-American characters have in the world uh, where the police look at them differently just because of the color of their skin. Yeah, I thought he yeah. he played that really well. And I think that he he he's the one who cast to carry the scene and he presents it in a way that um, that you really get it. You get that sense of of you know, how he's being looked at this way. And it works really well. I, I think he's great. He's also in Mudbound, which was just out last year. And uh, he was in, uh, he had a busy year last year because Mudbound, this and Kong Skull Island. So, I mean, he was- yeah. uh, um, And the disaster mention, artist. And the disaster artist, yeah. So, plus he was in the, plus he was in the TV show Freedom Fighters, The Ray. <laughs> oh, I missed that. I did too. Uh, there and and also, you know, he's in uh, Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams on Amazon, and uh, there are a number of people in this movie who are in episodes of of that one. It makes me yeah. want to actually check out Electric Dreams. I've I've heard I, pretty good things about it, but I'm I actually am not caught up on Black Mirror, so I need I, I can only have one of these kinds of shows in my life at a time. That's exactly the position I'm in. I'm like, I've got to get through this crocodile episode. One of these right. days, I'm not falling asleep. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, but so. no. I have not seen Mudbound. I I uh, I haven't either. And actually, uh, now that you know, with all the Oscar sort of buzz around it, particularly around Mary J. Blige, I, I that's moved up on the list. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, he's fantastic in this, and and as the sort of leader of our little play, I, I think he's he's great. Yeah, I so. agree. Barry Aykroyd behind the camera. Uh, I again, I really like Barry Aykroyd's work. And I think in this case, we have that documentary style, but also shot with vintage lenses. You know, I mean, he's doing it in a way that is authentic to the time. And and I think he captures a great look and color of the film and the way it moves through this through this room in particular. We've already talked about the sort of production design of the room, um, it, it, giving us a sense of space. I, I I feel like I'm sitting in the room piled up on the bed, you know, when when Larry says uh you know hey julie air conditioner is real good over here i feel like he's inviting me over there it's like cut or it's like you know framed in such a way that that he's patting the bed and he's like okay let's uh, let's everybody go get on the bed like it, i've been there i've been in that kind of a situation i think he captured it very well well and i mean we've talked about him on the show before because i mean he did the hurt locker he did jason Bourne. he did um uh, other films with uh, Paul Greengrass, and uh, he's he's one of those guys who certainly has handled uh, the Jiggly Monkey Cam. Right? Um, you look at some of the stuff in United ninety three or Jason Bourne, and he it, there's definitely some of that going on in those films. Yeah, but I didn't feel it was ever over the top in this film. Like I felt like they they found a nice feel for kind of the documentary vibe that they were going for. And they kept it that way. So it, it always felt like there was a hint of that documentary handheld, I'm following the action, I'm finding the action sort of stuff. But it never was obnoxious. And uh, and I'm a fan of the Jiggly Monkey Cam. I think it's great when it's that crazy handheld action stuff. And uh, But I, I felt like they found the right tone for it in the context of the story they were telling here. Well, I think this scene in particular is a good example, if not the best example of when this handheld kind of jiggly monkey monkey really works. Here, it gives us a sense of of uh, you know of the crowd, of a sense of that we're we're among the faces. You know, our eyes are sitting at a level of the faces, looking up at the at the play going on with us. We might be standing behind some people, but it really feels like we have a presence in the room. I actually think even better example as we go out of this scene is looking at any time we go into the police station right it is a madhouse and i have a very like great sense of compression of of being in this maw of um, and and the throngs of people that are are there because they're being booked they're there because they're witnesses 
They're there because they're cops. And there is a sense of relief every time we're invited. And this happens multiple times. We're invited as the camera to come with some characters into an interrogation room. And I always feel like a breath of fresh air, like, oh, finally, we're out of the crowd. That is an example of, I think, exceptional camera that that they put us in this place of of intensity and relief and and, and are able to pull us and push us back and forth between those two perspectives just by how they how how they move the camera around the room what did you think of bigelow uh, as far as the direction here i mean do you think that um this from what we've talked about on the series so far from toward the beginning with near dark and point break all the way up through this i mean uh, i mean obviously she's done some big films in between and certainly hurt locker and zero dark 30 are much more in line with this than some of those other films but i mean i i felt like she still handles uh the action well she handles the situations well and uh, she does a good job of building uh a film i feel yeah i do too and i think we we get to see you know uh, just a, a her as an adept action filmmaker you know using those tools in, in a way that makes such great sense for this movie um and and it's scary and it, it's scary to do something that doesn't involve you know vampires ripping the the hoses out through the hood of a semi truck like it's it's scary when you're doing something that's so real but the same tool set applies and i think she does it very well a sense of intensity a sense of pace and adrenaline um that that she uh, sort of applies to this thing you can tell she loves the the movement she loves the the intensity as soon as carl shoots the starting pistol out the window and you you start the race um the, the race between the the cops that are are going to come in and compress the algiers and the guys inside who are just trying to figure out what's going to happen next i i think the the bouncing back and forth between the, those two things and balancing those perspectives and the perspective of dismukes on the street it, it's it, it it all just clicks for me the um i i did question and it's funny because at the end of the film, we get, uh, as you sometimes get in uh, reenactment stories where they're telling a true story, you get those title cards coming up at the end, you know, kind of explaining, you know, this is where they are now sort of thing. And they say the starter pistol was never found. And, you know, it made me wonder how if that really was something that happened, Um because, I mean, obviously they interviewed a lot of these people who were there. And so, yeah. I, I, but it made me curious, like, was that something they fictionalized to get the police there and to kind of set the whole stage for this thing? Or was it, um, or was it, you know, was it something that actually happened? Because obviously, you know, later, you know, Carl shoots the gun and then, it, I don't know, it just seemed strange to me that he was so surprised, like, oh, there's police outside. It's like, you idiot you you just set yourself up for this situation you know you're shooting the starter pistol at the cops and they're like, oh they'll never know where we are okay maybe not but you're the one who shoots it and then all of a sudden the cops are at your door i mean it just was like put two and two together you idiot and just don't do it to begin with well, <laughs> and so that that made me really frustrated that um i don't know i just i i struggled to 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 buy into it being a real thing because it made me doubt the the screenwriters and the honesty of that particular thing, especially since there was never a starter pistol found. Well, I don't know how to respond to that because on one hand, I I feel like you're you are are you're you're judging a, a narrative element in the story, which is totally fair. And at the same time, uh, you're judging an amalgamation of stories and interviews that were true. Like somebody yeah. had said this is a thing that happened to the screenwriters to the point at which they wrote it and penned it yeah. into the script. I, I feel like it's unfair to sit in judgment of that. At some point, I can put myself in the head of Carl and say, hey, I'm going to mess around with these guys because I don't like them. I don't trust them. And playing a game with them is a way for me to disrespect them. And that game is going to be, I'm going to fire the starting pistol because I don't think they'll ever find it. And this will cause them to run in circles. And that element ends up starting something that that he never expected, never would have expected, and ends up ends in just a tragic you know, loss of life. Um I, I can't sit in judgment of that. Yeah, he's no, maybe I mean, he I, was an idiot. Well, no, and I, I can't sit in judgment of him. I shouldn't, I should say, sit in judgment of, of what the real Carl might have done. I mean, maybe he did do that. Um, but it just and then it goes to this whole situation with the police. It's just like, you know, nobody even says oh, it was just a starter pistol. Like, you know, I don't, I don't know. It just it made know, me question it, it, moments of the situation. 
it is a it is a question. I mean, I get that, but I think that goes to like who, to me. I read that and say, well, uh, Mark Bowles sat down and interviewed a number of people who said there was a starter pistol involved, and this is an issue of contention in the the sort of legal language of the case because they never found a starter pistol. So where did the starter pistol go? That doesn't make me question his intensity or, or his intention. It doesn't make me question, you know, the screenwriters. It makes me question. Uh, it makes me just think, you know, there's something else going on in the story that this title card is attempting to tell me is more complicated uh, than, you know, and, and they couldn't make sense of it any other way than yeah. to say what we think happened with the starter pistol based on. Um, events. Maybe the starter pistol ran out of the room with one of the characters that got out. You know, who knows where the starter yeah. pistol ended up? No, I, so, I, there's I, questions. I can see all of that. It just, it made for a frustrating element of the story. I but, you know, that. that's what happens with with real stories sometimes yeah. is, is true stories can be frustrating because things don't happen as you feel like they should have. Uh, I do think, and I know you you already ha- uh, mentioned you have problems with Will Poulter, but uh, between Will Poulter and, and John Boyega, I think they, they, you know, here are two Brits pay- playing, you know, incredibly difficult roles, I think, and uh, uh, in sort of American cultural fabric. And I think they do a fantastic job. I, I adore John Boyega. I think he's fantastic. I think he's, he's you know, you get this just sense that he's he's really he's he's going to be one for the ages and i i think they've they both you know handled the material well yeah <laughs> I, I wasn't in love with john boyega in this either i i think that he was fine um honestly i i was um uh, he played an interesting character because he was largely um you know trying to walk the line through the bulk of this of the story you know trying to to play the play the black guy that the white guys would be able to handle, right? And, mm-hmm. and you know, bringing them coffee and and you know, helping them out and just being that helpful guy. It was interesting the line that he was walking. I never completely loved him um, until the moment where he's with the um, the two detectives who he finds out are actually um, uh, you know calling him a suspect in the whole situation. That was the first time where I was like, okay, all of a sudden I felt like this John Boyega character became interesting to me. Like he never fully um, clicked in with me until that moment. Yeah. And, and that, and that for me really defined like everything that John Boyega was doing in the film it all narrowed down to that one point. But up until then I was never quite in love with him. I, I was already in love with him and I still agree with you. I, I feel like that, that <laughs> sequence was, was particularly powerful. And, and I think yeah. he handled just the, the look on his face and the change in his face when, when they said, you know, stage one, stage two, stage three, you know, as they're going through that, the stages of the interrogation of those conversations, as they say, I think was a very powerful moment. So, yeah. uh, and, and just one other shout out to Jack Rayner as demons. Uh, Jack is a, a, one of the, uh, police officers in inside but i uh was such a huge fan of jack as the older brother in sing street that i have to shout out now he's a terrible racist cop uh and uh he's he's great he's just great i think he is uh, i think he he's a good guy who was encouraged to do something he didn't understand and um and and it really highlights the the danger of these sort of interrogation techniques that ran unchecked and um but but his performance uh, and him as an actor, he's just terrific. Big fan. That's really funny because um, he, he, yes, he worked really well as kind of the the idiot cop in yeah. this particular story. Um, I thought he was uh, Irish. I didn't realize he's a Colorado boy. <laughs> That's really yeah. funny. Yeah, he's born in Longmont. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> Very funny. Very funny. Yeah. So, yeah, his his yeah. mother is Irish, and yeah. uh, he's lived in in Ireland. Uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, he's he's one of us. That's one right. of us. <laughs> one of us. Uh, How to do an award season, Andy? It, this is a it's a tricky one because it just came out last year. It's still kind of wrapping up award season. Some of the nominations that it has received. Um, the uh, winners have not been announced yet. So at this point, where we are, it has four wins and 17 other nominations. Uh, three of the wins are from the African American Film Critics Association for Best Ensemble, Best Song by the Roots, It Ain't Fair. And I don't know how this counts as a win, but it was 
it was i guess it won as one of its top 10 their top 10 films of the year it came in fifth place um mm-hmm. a lot of other nominations seem to be focusing on um on bigelow she was nominated by the alliance of women journalists for best director she did lose to greta gerwig for ladybird um so but yeah that's that's some of where it is right now four wins 17 nominations it's it's one of those ones that I think people were were looking at as, oh, this is going to be a big award movie. And then I think, you know, audiences and critics just kind of came to it and said, yeah, maybe not. You know, it's unfortunate, but I think that's reflected in the numbers, how to do with the box office. Yeah, it really is. Um, Bigelow was given $34 million to work with for the film. The movie had a very limited release on just 20 screens, July 28th, 2017, opposite the Emoji Movie and Atomic Blonde. Very different films coming out that weekend. Uh, Before it did go wide the following Friday, August 4th, opposite The Dark Tower and Halle Berry's Kidnap. It was pushed into production to be released on the 50th anniversary of the riots, which was July 25th, uh, 2000 or 1967. So, so that limited release came really close to that. But the the week of limited release wasn't enough to grow the buzz for the movie, as it never topped eighth place at the box office. The movie did go on to make 16.8 million domestically and 4.7 million internationally for a total of 21.5 million. That, unfortunately, wasn't enough to make it a profitable movie. It never found its home and ended up with an adjusted loss per finished minute of $87,000. This is one of those that is heartbreaking for me uh, because I enjoyed my experience with it so much. Uh, as a film and as one of Bigelow's uh, works, it is a highlight of our of our series uh, talking about her films and uh, certainly a a deep and gratifying relief after my experience with, um, you know, Vampire Central, <laughs> uh, which I did not, I did not connect with, and and I know you did, and so uh, I, I I almost feel like there's a a bifurcation of Bigelow fandom uh, that that it's sort of hard to be a fan of both of these kinds of movies for her, and uh, and and so this and Zero Dark Thirty and Hurt Locker are, are high on my list, and. And I um, see, I don't think I'd agree with you because uh, Zero Dark Thirty and and Hurt Locker are way high on my list. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I just uh, well, this, maybe the problem is, is with you. <laughs> maybe you are the one. That's broken. <laughs> oh, well, the critics in the box office uh, take certainly seem to agree yeah. with me. Uh, so I, you know, I don't know for, for me, it was a it was a big win. And uh, I'm I'm glad to have watched it. Uh, and get it not on the list. Well, here's the thing. I mean, Catherine Bigelow has proven herself. I mean, we've done two series uh, of her so far, and it may end up doing a third one at some point because she is such a fascinating person to talk about. I think that even if I feel that this was a misstep, I feel that she is such a compelling director. She does such interesting things. I really, really enjoy watching her work. And um, I know she has a couple uh, producing projects coming up. One is Mogadishu, Minnesota. One is uh, a project with J.C. Chandor. Um, I, I, she's not directing. She doesn't have anything listed as, uh, as upcoming directing projects. But, uh, you know, I just feel that she is a really compelling director. She tells fascinating stories. She's a, a, a female director who isn't, you know, has never been afraid of taking the helm of big action films and i've always found her just a fascinating fascinating storyteller so even if i found this to be a misstep um i am always going to be drawn to what she does and i'm very much looking forward to looking at more of her films me too and with that andy we should rank it let's do it head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel you'll see our entire list of movies or you can just swipe over in your show notes and tap on flick chart it'll take you straight to this one where you can add it to your list and see how it stacks up to ours. First up, we have Detroit or Numi's The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Dragon Tattoo for me. Dragon oh, Tattoo for me. Detroit or The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. I'm going with Munchausen, please. That'd be Detroit for me. It's going to be a lot of these. I know. I think Here, so, too. Are you ready? <laughs> Here we go. One, One two, two, three. three paper. Rock. You got it. Off to a good start. <laughs> Get it <laughs> well, in the top half. Say. Here we go. Detroit or The Princess Mononoke. I'm going to say Mononoke. Uh, oh dear. I'll say Mononoke too. Detroit or Star Trek three, the search for Spock. Detroit. Star Trek. <gasps> One, One, two, two three, three, scissors. Paper. Oh man. All right. Detroit or the Born Legacy. 
Born Legacy for me, please. Okay, now that was the one with uh, uh, the bow and arrow boy. Jeremy Renner. Bow yeah, I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> I bet he loves being called that. <laughs> this is his alter ego. Hey, you, bow and arrow boy. Come here. Bow and arrow boy. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have Detroit or Thief. Early Michael Mann. I'm going to go with Thief, please. Uh, oh, definitely Detroit. All Here right. we go. Here we go. One, One two, two, three. three. Rock. Scissors. Okay. Crush you. All right. All right. Detroit or Die Hard with a Vengeance. <laughs> Die I'll Hard. Some, uh, Jeremy Irons, please. <laughs> Detroit or The Thin Man. The Thin Man for me, I'll please. give you The Thin Man, yeah. Detroit or Die Hard 2. Die Hard 2, please. Die Hard 2. All right. Well, it's higher than I would have liked. <laughs> <laughs> but your two Rochambeau wins put it at number two thirty-seven on our list. So there you I, go. I, yeah, it's a that's a, a disappointing place uh, on the list there sure uh, for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me on my personal list, this ended up at one eighteen out of one thousand fourteen movies, uh, putting it at eighty-eight percent. How'd you do? This ended up at twenty-nine fifty-two out of thirty-nine thirty, or a twenty-five percent. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's been a long time since we've parted ways on a movie quite this this broadly. Yeah, I don't think I don't think Near Dark was even this far apart. No, no, I don't think it was. Uh, if we go by the algorithm uh, on letterbox.com slash the next reel, I should be dropping it at four and a half stars. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Four and a half stars with a like. Wow. Holy yeah. cow. Yeah. Do the math, man. Do the math. That Where is are you. <laughs> OK, I'm at two. Two stars and a like. I I wanted to like it more, but I just didn't. It was a very frustrating experience for me. Uh, so that puts it at three point two five overall. So that rounds yeah. up to three and a half. Yeah. And I nice. guess I'll give it. I'll, I'll give you. I, I I said two stars and a like. I, I meant two stars and no like. Um, but yeah. you like right. it, so it's yeah, yeah I like, like it. Yeah, we average up to the like. I yeah. uh, this is good. I'm a defender of the film. I enjoy the look of it. I enjoy what it says. I, there may be so, so much that I don't understand about what's going on. I absolutely uh, understand that. And I I hope to learn more uh, because this is a part of history that uh, I, I feel like I need to I need to do more with. So I, I guess my opinion could change. Uh, but uh, right now, I, I really enjoyed this experience. Excellent. Well, I'm glad you did. <laughs> 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 all right, all right. So where do we go from here, Andy? We're done now with this particular Catherine Bigelow uh, series. Holy cow, did this one seem to fly by. Uh, it went by so fast. Uh, next up, we are actually going to head over to Korea with Trump and his team. But instead of sitting down with Kim in the North, <laughs> oh, man, <laughs> we're sticking with the South, where we are going to be looking at Park Chan-wook's Vengeance trilogy. Kicking it off with Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, we're then going to look at Old Boy and end with Lady Vengeance. It'll be a complete uh, different feel for what we were just looking at. I have a feeling this one's going to feel like it flies by too. I, we've been uh, we've been talking about finding a way to squeeze Old Boy in for a long, long time in some way or another. So I'm excited we finally get this trilogy on the books. I have only seen Old Boy. I have not seen either of the others. So I'm very curious to see what my experience is with this uh, trilogy of, yeah. of Park Chan Wooks. Me too. Uh, thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. The next reel couldn't happen without the hard work of Stephen Smart. Runs our Instagram program uh, all the way from Ireland. Ben Stierick helps out over there. Uh, ben Lott runs all things on Twitter and The Blot Spot. And the next reel theme, Ragtime Instrumental, can be found by Eli Catlin right over on SoundCloud. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. <laughs> Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon always doeth. Uh, since I, think I like we should the go film, up. let's start at the bottom and go up. Yeah, I think we should. I've got some <laughs> one stars. I, I I actually had, well, I had trouble uh, choosing my my trailer because your your comments. You mean? My comments. There's an undercurrent of people who didn't like the movie because they clearly have issues with race themselves, and so I tried to find a comment that that 
uh, was focused on the film. Uh, and so you end up with comments like, what a mess of a film, one star. Or in this one, poor acting, storyline was a shambles. Uh, and this is supposed to be a true story? I normally would not rate a movie so low, but this was just not even worth watching. I feel as if I wasted money and time out of my life just by renting it and trying to watch it all the way through. So there, it's kind of the sentiment of the one stars. And, and finally, E.B. Anderson says, torture porn dressed up as civil rights era history lesson is still torture porn. Uh, and, and so clearly there is a sense that the violence was, was hard to watch. You know, it, in all sobriety here, uh, that feels very much like the point in this, in, in this movie. Like it's hard to watch maybe because it was hard to experience. That's possible. I mean, because certainly as I look at the five star films, um, there are a lot of people who give it five stars because, uh, you know, the pain of the experience. Yeah. You know? So it's it's interesting how different people view something. Right. But I have a five star by uh, by Kimberly who says, uh, so well done. I couldn't finish watching it. I, cu- I couldn't <laughs> even like watch it be a one star. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even watch this movie. It must have been an absolute nightmare to be in Detroit during this period of time. I was brought to sobbing tears before the middle of this film. With that, I can only assume that this movie was that well done. Oh my goodness. Like she really did turn it off. <laughs> she did. It was so uh, hard that she couldn't even finish. Andy, so. I'm going to start turning off movies I love right in the middle too. <laughs> the Godfather. Oh, I love Fredo. Turn it off. I'm going to start turning off movies that I think I'm not going to love, like in the middle, right at the point where I'm like, I think this is going to turn. And then I'm going to just convince myself that I, that the rest of it was brilliant. That's a better strategy. And, (laughs) and since you brought it up, Andy, let's do a little thought experiment. At what point in Detroit would you have turned it off? Right after they, uh, they blew up that little girl in the building. That would have been it. That would have been it. That's only about 18 minutes into the movie. (laughs) That's all I needed. Thanks, Amazon. <laughs> That's actually a great game. We should start doing that on movies we don't connect with. When would you have turned it off so that you would have had a good memory of it? So, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the funniest things ever. <laughs> it really is. And, and and we've got to find a way to put that. Like, where do we work that in and and just make it like uh, a part of our rating, like eighteen minutes. <laughs> 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 to keep it five stars. To where keep would it, it what would it have taken off? to keep it? Five, what did we even call it? Oh my I, god! We this, call it the we five star cutoff. The five star cutoff, Andy. <laughs> oh my god! We need shirts. The five star cutoff. <laughs> then it's a new ranking. Uh, this is almost better than flick chart. Uh, the five star cutoff. Uh, where is your five star cutoff? Is that? Oh my god. Oh man, that's so funny. Oh, oh. thank you, Amazon. That is brilliant. <laughs> so brilliant i'm gonna think about that with every movie i watch yeah well the, it certainly would be fun to bring up yeah totally so, what's your five star uh, especially movies like this where you know it doesn't stick with you like where would your near dark five star cut off have been it, early it really early, really like, early, early. <laughs> like like what what were the opening credit titles looking like like maybe i'd get through those yeah right <laughs> Oh my! Oh, that's really funny. So funny. That's a, that's a high bar. Five star cutoff. That's a very high bar. That is. Assuming the five star cutoff on our five star movies is all the way through. Right. Exactly. Oh my goodness! This is delightful. New thing. <laughs> I love new things. New thing. <laughs> It's hard to believe that we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You're telling me producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our originals page when shopping for books and movies we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great conversations. I was so excited for our big Star Trek film franchise series this season. All those movies adapted from Gene Roddenberry's original 1960s TV show. As a huge fan, I know that you geeked out over analyzing the adaptations. Absolutely. From the motion picture to the Kelvin timeline films, seeing the Enterprise crews on the big screen was a dream come true. Our list of source material isn't just all books and plays. We have the original series in our list of source material. You can rent the episodes to watch and enjoy and support the show in the process. 
For our Millennium Trilogy series, we covered films adapted from the original books that launched Lizbeth Salander, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, The Girl Who Played with Fire, and The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest. As much as I love Fincher's version, the original Swedish versions are the way to go. We also did our Die Hard series in Season 7. I can't believe Die Hard and Die Hard 2 were adaptations! Two of the greatest action movies ever. Well, one of them at least. The other is awfully fun, though. We revisited the classic Mary Poppins for our 1960s movie musical series. A spoonful of sugar always helps the medicine go down. Old Boy was intense for our Park Chan-wook Vengeance trilogy. And East of Eden and Giant were highlights of our James Dean series. And a fun time travel mind bender with predestination to cap things off. Find all the books behind these adaptations and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Dive into the source material for your favorite movies. Check it out today. Thenextreel.com slash originals. Originals.